afternoon, everyone. Fantastic to welcome Dr. Peter Asimov. He's here in person, and we have a few people in the room, which is brilliant. We also want to welcome you on Zoom and on, um, on YouTube. So um, please, we hope we have a great afternoon to, um, today. I'd like to introduce you to Peter and to tell you that he is um, the Fondation Wiener Ansbach Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the Laboratoire de Musicologie, Université Libre de Bruxelles. He recently completed a PhD at the University of Cambridge and holds prior degrees in comparative literature and musicology from Brown University and the University of Oxford. His writing has published, been published in 19th century music, music, ima music image instrument, and the Journal of the Royal Musical Association. He is currently working on projects exploring the legacy of philology in the music of Olivier Messiaen and the artist artistry of Yvonne Loriot, and is an active and accomplished pianist and chamber musician. From February 2022, he'll begin a position as Lumley Research Fellow at Rodman College, Cambridge. He's going to talk to us today. You can see the, the title of his presentation. Um, and it's going to look at philology and friction between Indian scales and French modernism. Please welcome Dr. Peter Azamo. Thank you so much, um, Barbara, for this invitation. And I'm overjoyed uh, and honored to be here in person. And it's a real privileged opportunity as an early career scholar to, to share some work in progress and to benefit from uh, the discussion I hope will follow. And thanks also to Maria uh, Stratikou uh, for your help coordinating my visit. When Claude Debussy suggested that his friend Victor Ségalen, author, world traveler, famed apologist for exoticism, write about Hindu music, Ségalen replied eagerly, of course, there's much to say about Hindu music that has never been said. First of all, we must let go of our prejudices about sound. This was unlikely to pose a problem for Debussy of all people. Yet Segalen, struggling to describe Indian music in a letter, directed Debussy's attention toward a narrower target. Quote, it would be better, I imagine, to focus on a music assumed to be beautiful and homogenous by reason of caste and ritual necessity, the music of the Aryans of Vedic India. One would have, for one's material, an age of very noble allure, not too strange to our thinkers, because Aryan, not too familiar, because distant in time and space." End quote. Debussy demonstrated interest in Indian music on various occasions over the years, most famously during his 1913 encounter with Inayat Khan, although the imprint of this contact on Debussy's music is disputed. If Segalin conveyed little concrete about Indian music, his comments encapsulate the ambivalent cultural significance of India, more precisely Hindu India, for reasons to become clear, in early 20th century France. On one hand, the experience of Indian music for the French subject was, like any unfamiliar cultural product, marked by initial estrangement, potentially requiring a suspension of prejudice, or potentially alluring for its difference. On the other hand, Indian music bore a particular apposite significance on account of an Aryan heritage, that is, race, presumed by many at the turn of the 20th century to be common to both India and France. The attraction of ancient Indian music lay in this perceived duality, radical aesthetic novelty underpinned by a fantasy of deep kinship. In this talk, which is extracted from a larger article project, I'll examine how the ambivalence of India in the European imagination, suspended between ideas, ideals perhaps of alterity and ancestrality, motivated a significant current in French modernist composition. I'll weave together two main strands. First, the importance of so-called modal composition to post-Wagnerian French musical identity. And second, India's centrality to European constructions of a racialized Aryan heritage. The confluence of these two strands helps us grasp how and why the reification of Indian modes in French musical discourse led to their emergence as a key compositional resource in the 1920s and 30s. The first strand requires little recapitulation here, musical modality, which in turn of the century French context, context generally is reductively meant scales beyond major and minor, coalesced around variously nationalistic discourses of ancient, ecclesiastical, and folk music, fueled at the fin, fueled at the fin de siècle by Germanophobic anxieties around bloated chromaticism 
modalism, the term I'll use here to encompass modalities and musical qualities, but also its ideological baggage, came to infuse French compositional practice more broadly and flexibly by the interwar period, culminating in an approach that Benedict Lesman terms modalité libre, free modality. The second strand bears the legacy of a century of comparative philological scholarship concomitant with the formulation of the Indo-European hypothesis, or following Leon Polyakov's term, the Aryan myth, prevalent in fin de siècle European intellectual and cultural consciousness, but worth a brief overview here. The history of the Indo-European hypothesis is bound up with British imperialism in India. The observation of significant structural similarities between Sanskrit and Persian, Greek, Latin, the Romance, Germanic, Slavic, and Celtic languages is usually attributed to a 1786 address by William Jones, a colonial jurist of Calcutta, founder of the Asiatic Society of Bengal. Jones undertook the study of Sanskrit with the express purpose of second-guessing his Indian advisors on Hindu legal traditions, or dharma, through his own textualist interpretation of sources. But Sanskrit's apparent affinities with this startling array of languages led Jones to hypothesize a common linguistic fount, a theory which unleashed a wave of research across Europe over the 19th century. Grammarians, including Franz Bock, Wilhelm von Humboldt, and the brothers Grimm, distilled essential characteristics of Indo-European languages by comparing them against a common field of grammatical elements, thereby giving rise to a discipline known as comparative philology. August Schleicher designed an Indo-European family tree and even attempted to reverse engineer the proto-Indo-European Ursprung. Um, yet the enduring <coughs> significance of these developments was not simply the academic disciplines of linguistics or Indology, but a new epistemological paradigm as Siraj Ahmed has written, quote, after Jones, language ceased to be the medium of knowledge, the veridical discourse of the Enlightenment, the crystalline lens through which one sees the truth, and became instead the privileged object of knowledge, end quote. For many, however, linguistic relationships were an intermediate finding, and the true stakes of ling language history were human history itself. Taking the spread of language as an index for that of people, scholars sought more elaborate or convoluted means of extrapolating the comparative method beyond language, seeking to link common linguistic roots to a broader Indo-European patrimony. Uh, Friedrich Max Müller devised a science of religion by linking Indo-European languages to belief systems through analyses of metaphorical expression. Adolf Pichte invented the technique of linguistic paleontology in efforts to deduce from shared vocabularies what early Indo-European societies were like. Through the accumulation of such slippages, the premise of an Indo-European linguistic family swelled into constructions of Indo-European, sometimes also called Aryan, culture, mentality, and race. Indo-European languages were contrasted to Semitic ones, notably Hebrew and Arabic. Aryans were contrasted to Semites, Jewish and Muslim alike. And such language-derived concepts of race by a tautological feedback cycle were subsequently construed as the ontological basis for wide-ranging cultural and historical uh, and linguistic phenomena. Comparativist scientists, the sciences thus reconfigured human history along what Vassant Kaiwar has called the Aryan model, with two main pillars, one Greek, one Indian. The study of Sanskrit, presumed among the earliest Indo-European languages, not only upended European beliefs in the historical and divine priority of Hebrew, but also reformulated Europe's relationship to Greco-Roman antiquity, as reference to Sanskrit texts and Hindu spirituality suddenly appeared essential to understanding Greek and Latin language, mythology, and society. Fustel de Coulanges' landmark history, La Cité Antique, situated Greece and Rome along an Indo-European continuum, thereby placing modern France, already the self-proclaimed inheritor of Greco-Roman civilization for centuries, as the repository of even more extensive Indo-European cultural turned ethnic heritage. Indo-European essentialism nourished Aryanist supremacism, as popular texts like Émile Bourneuf's La Science des Religions or Édouard Drummond's La France Juive sharpened comparativist research into racist invective. And even as more scrupulous research called into question Sanskrit's ancestral status, and gave the lie to any racial, cultural, even linguistic essentialism. Repeated entreaties of leading linguists in the early 20th century, like Saussure and Meillet, to apply the term Indo-European to language and not race, only demonstrate how widespread the conflation had become. 
Such subtleties did little to curb entrenched perceptions of India as an ancestral cradle, however. And so India, variously conceived as remote ancestor, distant cousin, or exotic stranger, frustrated binaries of self and other at a time when the politics of nationalism and imperialism increased the stakes of identity. Today, it's rightly difficult to view Aryanism as anything other than that which led to the Shoah. Yet this teleology toward extremism overshadows many subtler avenues by which Aryanist logics infiltrated art and science alike. Recent researchers have argued that comparative philology and Indo-Europeanist discourses were hegemonic in the late 19th and early 20th century European humanities, infiltrating scientific empiricism as well as romantic spiritualism, wielded to justify colonialist and anti-colonialist ideologies, touted as proof of Jesus Christ's divinity and as proof of the opposite. Understanding the scope of Indo-Europeanist thought is essential not only to making greater sense of wide swathes of late 19th and early 20th century intellectual and artistic production, but also to better grasp the epistemic and cultural foundations upon which Aryanist extremism took root. But even after several generations of intellectual historiography, attention to how Indo-Europeanism infiltrated and shaped artistic production remains scarce. In the context of music studies, uh, the traces of Indo-Europeanism have often been swallowed by broader critiques of exoticist and or neoclassicist representation. In the context of French historical studies, Indo-Europeanism has often been subsumed within um, studies of nationalism or anti-Semitism, while eluding the gaze of post-colonial criticism. After all, the construct emerged from British, not French, imperialism. But Indo-Europeanism's epistemic entanglement with comparative philology made an imprint distinct from other nationalist, colonialist, or exoticist appropriations. It's one thing to observe how Indian dramatic, literary, or religious texts nourished European romanticism. But such points of contact, contact form only a small proportion of how the Indo-European idea, and crucially the concomitant paradigm of philological comparativism, enduringly, enduringly drove formal artistic techniques and priorities. Identifying this imprint requires expanding our perspective beyond critiques of stereotypical or fantastical representation that have dominated musicological studies of Orientalism to encompass a broader critique of scientific production, a stance attuned to how epistemic practices such as philology reinscribe constructions of race and nation into modern knowledge and art. Accordingly, in tracing this history today, I'll resist the simple assertion that Indian modes were frictionlessly borrowed by French composers in the early decades of the 20th century by interrogating how the epistemology and ideology of philological comparativism, which mediated the construction and appropriation of these scales, drove modalism as a formal and identitarian doctrine. Philology's distinct mediating uh, force manifested, I'll argue, in two intertwined processes. One of racialization, the alignment of ancient India along an Indo-European continuum, and one of rationalization, as musical forms were atomized and reified to facilitate structural analysis. Treating isolated scale structures as a comparative grammarian treated verbal roots, musicologists compared Indian modes to Greek or medieval lookalikes through quasi-philological techniques. And through this concerted process of rationalized abstraction, Indian music circulated in modal tables attractive to composers as a source of raw materials, the supposed imminent structures of a racialized Indo-European musical patrimony, structurally assimilable to ancient Greek modality, plain chant modality, and French folk modality, thereby establishing an emergent Indo-European continuum along which Indian music appeared less an exotic other than a classical past. I'll trace this history in three sections, uh, weaving between musicology and composition, and showing the distance traveled by Indian modes as they came to be valued by notions of musical similarity and selfhood, no longer to be marked as Indian, but rather as French, and thus eventually unmarked altogether. Section one. So if William Jones is credited for unleashing philological comparatism broadly speaking, he also shaped European notions of Indian music directly through his famous study on the musical modes of the Hindus. In music as in language and law, Jones's agenda involved rescuing an authentically Hindu culture from centuries of what he perceived as Muslim contamination and political control. 
His musicological practice exemplifies Siraj Ahmed's contention that, philo that philology identifies tradition with texts alone, not on native experience, but on its destruction. Paralleling his attitude towards Sanskrit legal texts, Jones viewed musicological manuscripts as the only authoritative sources of knowledge, the pure fountain of Hindu learning, in his words, epistemically superior to contemporary practice, the authenticity of which he mistrusted. As his title suggests, he conceptualized Indian music principally through its modes, relying disproportionately on one manuscript source, the 17th century Ragavibodha, which he believed to be much older. Jones's study left a colonial, textualist, and Islamophobic legacy on European scholarship of Indian music for a long time to come, as Janaki Bakre and Lakshmi Subramanian have shown. Not least, it was central to François Joseph Fétis' notorious efforts to integrate music history via comparative philology into what Thomas Christensen calls his general ethnological history of humanity. Fétis sketched his, ver his vision of a music historiography modeled on comparative philology and the Aryan Semite binary in an 1850 letter to Franz Liszt. The history and displacements of human populations, he explained, had been demonstrated by the Sanskrit uh, roots, which abound in all the languages of antiquity and modernity. As for me, I prove it by comparing Indian scales as they existed 4,000 years ago with those of Arabia, which had not changed since the time of the Bible. He opened the first volume of his Histoire Générale de la Musique with an homage to comparative grammar, asking why these relations, these resemblances, so acute in the construction of these languages, if not because the people who spoke them and speak them still are all born of the Aryan race. Citing Jones, um, he described the tonal system of the Ary Aryas of India as the source of the musical systems of all peoples of the Aryan race, a, Wester a westward progression to Greece, then Rome, paralleled um, the imagined trajectory from Sanskrit to the modern languages of Europe. Fetis's profile of Indian music thus buttressed a priori links to Greek and thereby French music. Similarities drawn between Indian and European pitch systems signified to Petis not mere analogies, but evidence of racial continuity. Following Petis, racialized hypotheses of Indo-European music were propagated by a generation of Francophone philologists and musicologists seeking to incorporate music within the expanding comparativist framework. Medievalist Gaston Paris extrapolated Indo-Europeanist logic from language via poetry to popular song. Mixing racial and linguistic categories, he, envis uh, he envisaged a vast arboreal taxonomy recalling Schleicher's Stammbaum. Quote, the general design and family tree of our songs should someday be established more or less thus, going always from broadest to narrowest. We will go from humanity as a whole, to the white race, to the Aryans, to each group of Aryan people, Slavic, Germanic, Greco-Roman, Celtic, etc., to each people, each province, each canton, end quote. In 1886, Hellenist and Sanskritist Emil Burnouf unified the ancient musics of India and Greece, the medieval music of the Roman church, and present-day European, then present, European folk and church music under a common Aryan prism. Pierre Aubry, among the most renowned musicologists of his generation, appealed for the Indo-European project in a 1901 article. Quote, two musical elements, tonality and rhythm, correspond to a common quality in the Indo-European races as clearly as word roots or morphological inflections, he argued, calling upon musical musicologists to reconstruct Proto-Indo-European music as the linguists had attempted with the Proto-Indo-European language. And in 1909, Henri Bollet opened his Histoire de la Musique with, quote, Vedic India, mysterious India, cradle of the world, recounting how, quote, Indian music of Aryan origin, as we who are Aryan should not forget, would spread by way of Persia, by Greece, and gradually infiltrate its way toward Europe." End quote. That pronoun, we, telling you something about who his intended audience was in his mind. Yet for all these musicological adaptations of the Indo-European hypothesis, and we'll return to, to some more of these shortly, the suggestion that French composers might appropriate Indian music as a patrimonial reservoir was far from the fore. This isn't to deny that composers often imported ostensibly Indian melodies or dances for the sake of local color, in keeping with familiar techniques of 19th century Orientalist operatic composition. Such borrowings, which I loosely describe as archeological, offer an instructive point of contrast for the philologically mediated appropriation of modes emergent toward the end of the 19th century. 
these terms are to be taken as kind of ideal types rather than a hard and fast divide. So-called archaeological borrowings exemplified by melodies, dances, so-called notches by composers ranging from Massenet and Delive to Hahn, Duvernois, even Debussy, act as an acoustic counterpart to archaeologically informed set designs, serving to intensify the dramatic spectacle of an exoticized South Asian setting. The archaeological effect was often enhanced through paratextual labels, a title or footnote suggesting fidelity to a source, as already practiced in borrowings of folk melody. The composer's musical treatments of these borrowed melodies vary, sometimes assimilated to tonal harmonizations, elsewhere isolated against a static primitivist backdrop. Yet each borrowing is musically demarcated from the rest of the score, like an artifact in a museum case. In contrast, philologically mediated modalism is characterized not only by the atomization of music into supposedly structural units, but also because composers' desires to embody those forms were often tethered to their presumed Indo-European imminence. The most prominent advocate for the racialized appropriation of modality, though primarily with reference to Greek and folk, uh, French folk music rather than Indian, was Louis Albert Bourgo du Coudray, composer and music history professor at the Paris Conservatoire. Combining the aforementioned research of Fétis, Burnouf, and Paris with his own fieldwork, Bourgo du Coudray argued that common modal structures quote, can be found in the primitive music of all peoples of the Indo European group, that is, the Aryan race. But he went a step further, converting pseudo-philological theories of Grecian and folk modality into a polemic for the future of French composition. Quote, if these venerable modes come from a heritage common among all Aryans, one sees no reason why we wouldn't exploit this domain, which is part of the patrimony of our race and which is rightly ours. Again, this pronoun we and ours. Um, leading by example, Bourgo du Coudray modeled techniques of modal composition in his own work combining on the one hand an approach to folk-like melodic construction inspired by the Russian Mighty Handful, with on the other Louis Niedermeyer and Joseph d'Ortigue's doctrine of modal plain chant accompaniment, Bourgo du Coudray opted not to quote in the archaeological manner exemplified above, but rather to assimilate modal structures melodically and harmonically in the service of a racialized musical language. Although Bourgo du Coudray scarcely addressed India, others would soon apply his methods to Indian modes, which had been tagged as Aryan since Fétis. Among the first to do so was Gabriel Pierné in his incidental music for Isel, a four-act Gran Indien written for and premiered by Sarah Bernhardt in 1894. Rather than melodies, Pierné went straight for modes. In the score of the opening Obad, he notes mode, mode meta. Uh, the third number, Cortège Funèbre, is, is titled On the Mode Ferrati, transposed. The fifth, Stance du Prince, is simply marked mode vaira. Uh, Pierre's scales correspond to those in Fétis's Histoire Générale, and Fétis had in turn copied them from Jones. Pierre's harmonizations bear uh, Bourgo du Coudray's theoretical imprint, adhering to their respective modal pitch collections with only rare exceptions. And Bourgo du Coudray proudly uh, claimed Pierre's work as an extension of his own. In a letter he wrote after the premiere, he said, quote, Pierre Ney has made a most remarkable use of ancient modes in his music for Isaiah. Note how he says ancient, uh, already associating Indian modality with a classical past. He goes on, I was right to advocate these new techniques, and those with skill have made use of them. While Pierre Ney's approach may be described as philologically mediated insofar as he borrows at the structural, modal, rather than melodic level, he continued to demarcate the sections of his score which exploited Indian scales, reproducing a kind of artifactual display case impulse. And in doing so, he persisted in framing Indian modes as a musical digression or archaism, perhaps, rather than as the expression of a patrimonial identity Bourgo du Coudray had envisaged for French music. And it would take another generation of both philological scholarship and musical composition for Indian music to become a viable source of Frenchness. That brings us to section two. Um, one key figure in this process was Joanie Grosset. Uh, today, Grosset's name is perhaps most familiar to Messiaen specialists, um, for it was through Grosset's scholarship that Messiaen encountered the Deshi Talas, the compilation of 120 Indian rhythms famously integral to his compositional technique. Grosset himself, however, was largely written out of this history, not least by Messiaen, 
who preferred masquerading as a lone pioneer in personal communion with arcane sources. Uh, and not much more is generally known about Jose than his name. His career output is modest, critical translations of a few chapters from Bharata's Natya Shastra, a 2,000-year-old treatise on drama. Uh, one of those chapters is shown here. And a chapter on Indian music published in Albert Lavignac's Encyclopédie de la Musique et Dictionnaire du Conservatoire in 1913, which we'll see more of in a moment. That's all he published. Yet the impact of his work upon French composition belies this meager bibliography. Uh, Rosé was not a musician, but a Sanskrit philologist whose scholarship embodies the epistemological biases baked into his training under Paul Regnault at the University of Lyon. Early on, he justified his research by arguing that Indian music, quote, reaches back to the earliest appreciable manifestations of the Indo-European race to which we belong. Grosse never traveled to India and conceivably never heard any Indian musicians. Accordingly, his sources are textual rather than sonic, ranging from Sanskrit manuscripts consulted at the French National Library to a range of secondary, often British, colonial literature. And his philological predilections are reflected in his privileging of theory over practice, structure over process, Hindu over Muslim, and history over present to evoke a range of binaries, either explicit or latent, in his work. One of Kose's most important contemporary sources was the music and musical instruments of southern India and the Deccan, published in 1891 by Charles Russell Day. Kose's recourse to Day is significant, as Day, a decorated British captain who participated in multiple imperial campaigns, also embraced the Aryan myth, a rarer perspective among British imperialists who were seldom interested in propagating a narrative of ethnic kinship with the populations they subjugate. Among the most salient novelties of Day's study for the European reader was a table of 72 heptatonic scales. These scales represent what had become known to Carnatic musicians as the Melakarta system for raga classification. Essentially, the system elaborates combinatorial arrangements of the seven svaras which divide an octave. Uh, in Sargam nomenclature, sa and pa remain fixed, ma can occupy one of two positions, and ri, ga, da, and ni can each occupy one of three positions, so long as pitch overlaps are avoided within the scale. Day kind of illustrates this in his, uh, in his comparative table. The resulting multiplications yield 72 scalar configurations, which Day proceeded to lay out in Western staff notation. And it should not go unnoticed that, as represented here, the heptatonic Greek modes, diatonic and chromatic genera alike, and the European major and minor scales may also be located within this complex. The 72 Melakartas are widely attributed to the 17th century Chaturdandi Prakashika of Venkatamakin, who claimed that any raga could be classified into one of the Melakartas according to its pitch content and certain taxonomic principles he established. Yet for all the scheme's abstract logic, it was so full that it generated a significant theoretical supplement. As Venkatamakin himself admitted, Ragas in then current practice could be classified using only 19 of the 72 Melakartas, which he expounded upon in detail. As for the 53 theoretical others, he merely alluded to how they could be, perform uh, be formed. As he put it, I've designed the system as a honeycomb cabinet to provide a niche for all ragas, past, present, and future. In due course, experimentally minded Carnatic musicians, including the celebrated Tyagaraja, began composing using novel ragas derived from these supplemental melakartas, and the scheme gradually prevailed over numerous comp competing classificatory systems. By the early 20th century, the melakartas had accrued a privileged status in Carnatic music theory and pedagogy, a development which Amanda Weidman attributes in part to the universalist aura of their exhaustive combinatorial logic, which conveniently appeared to embody modern European, indeed quasi-philological, rationalistic ideals. Although Day does not offer any this historical perspective, his study reflected and likely promulgated the Melakarta's mounting status in Carnatic music theory. After presenting the classificatory system, he illustrates how the ragas which may be classified in the system operate as melody types, subject to distinct principles and characteristics, pitch hierarchies, ornamentation, etc. He provides a 10-page list of what Indian theorists designate as janya, or derived ragas, classified by Melakarta enlisted with their name, their pitch sequence, ascending and descending, and salient svaras, 
And he concedes that this presentation of ragas is still abstracted from necessary practical knowledge regarding the realization of the raga in performance, which is conveyed orally and internalized through experience. When adapting Day's discussion of the Melikartas for his encyclopedia chapter on Indian music, Joanny Grosse duplicated the Melikarta table under the heading Table of 72 Carnatic Scales in European Notation. But unlike Day, he provided hardly any description of how Melikartas related to Janya Ragas, only alluding to a handful by name alone. The center of gravity, especially as far as notated musical examples go, was thus significantly reweighted, with Grosse placing a proportionately greater emphasis on the theoretical Melikarta scales as the essential locus of Indian pitch organization, at the expense of more characteristic ragas, an unsubtle shift that reflects the philological preoccupation with structures over surfaces, theory over practice. Given its apparent, albeit incidental, incorporation of the heptatonic scales from Greek, Roman, and modern European music theory, the Melikarta system was interpreted by some to corroborate theories of essential Indo-European musical affiliation. Prefacing Day's monograph, Alfred James Hipkins remarked that the author, quote, shows us interesting resemblances between the leading modes of old Greece and Asia Minor and certain favorite modes of the Hindus. There is no sure evidence of an intimate musical connection between those countries and India, but the relationship of sister Aryan languages may have been paralleled by a relationship of musical types sufficient to justify a theory of descent instead of one of imitation. Grosset stopped short of explicitly positing a genealogical relationship between, between Indian and Greek music, but their conceptual proximity is taken for granted in his chapter. Suggestions of affiliation lurk behind Grosset's frequent comparisons and his use of Greek-derived terminology to describe Indian concepts. His attitudes likely approximated those of his erstwhile professor, Reignot, who declared that Indian and Greek theater shared, quote, an original ancestor reaching back to the faraway, primitive period of so-called Indo-European unity." Grosset's framing of the Melikartas thus reproduced the Aryanist historiographical model that had come to unite India and Greece in the French imagination. But there's another important aspect of Grosset's framing. Perhaps inspired by his commission for the conservatoire, Grosset took a page from Bourgo du Boucret's playbook, advocating that composers intelligently adapt ancient Indian music for the nourishment of future art. The first compo French composer to take up Grosset's call to action may have been Albert Roussel. Roussel was no stranger to Indian music, having taken his honeymoon in India a few years prior to the publication of Grosset's chapter. Two major compositions upon his return to France reflect impressions from his travels. The first, a poème symphonique titled Évocation, begun in 1910, and the second, an opéra ballet titled Padmavati, written uh, mainly in 1914. Given their Indian connection, the works are often grouped together as a phase of Roussel's career. Their respective mediations of Indian music, however, are radically opposed, and taken together, the two neatly illustrate India's ambivalent uh, position in the European imaginary between faraway land of exotic mysticism and locus of a shared Indo-European heritage. Evocation, as Jan Passler has shown at length, projected a deliberately generalized exoticism. Abiding by advice from his former professor Vincent Dandy, Roussel conceived Evocation as testimony to, quote, the sensations I felt over there, translated into our ordinary musical language, more European than Indian, end quote. Rather than representing any specific emplacement or local color, the object of Roussel's Evocation was deliberately blurry. Quote, India, Tibet, Indochina, China, Persia, it doesn't matter. The lush result is more Debussyist than anything else. Padmavati represented a major change of course. In response to a commission from incoming opera director Jacques Rouchet, Roussel recalled the legend of Padmavati, the beautiful queen who, following the Mughal invasion of Chittor, chose to die rather than sacrifice herself to their leader, Alaudin. Roussel sought the collaboration of his former classmate, musicologist and orientalist, Louis Lallois. Although Roussel had seen Chitor and even paraphrased Padmavati's story in his travel journal, he and Lallois sourced two literary retellings from the library of the École des Langues Orientales, where Lallois had studied. In contrast to the symphonic impressionism and evocation, Roussel turned to two formal models for Padmavati, 
The first was the Opera Ballet, an emblematically French genre not staged at the Opera since 1773, thereby aligning Padmavati with the blossoming interest in pre-revolutionary Baroque forms while casting a competitive glance at the ballet russe. The second model was Indian music theory, specifically the 72 Melakartas, freshly published between the completion of Evocation and the inception of Padmavati. The first Melakarta appears early in the opera with the opening aria of Padmavati's palace guard, Gora. Here, the notes of the Melakarta given by Grousset as Kamabardini are applied harmonically and melodically à la Borgo du Boubre, with only the rare chromatic appoggiatura in the orchestra. The Brahmin's dreamlike aria adheres strictly to the pitches of the 33rd Melakarta, transposed on A, and Padmavati's aria, closing the first act, uses the 15th dramatized with a transposed and chromaticized middle section. And I'll just play one of these examples here. This is the second one that I mentioned, the, the Brahmin's aria, with an accompanying harp that, that contributes at once a kind of archaizing and exoticizing Roussel thus deployed modes marked by European musicologists as Aryan, 
create a distinct sonic space for characters aligned with an ostensibly Aryan culture, in contrast to the stereotypical exoticism and denser chromaticism uh, deployed in connection with the Muslim invaders. Roussel's discourse to Melkartus for Hindu Aryas suggests he may have absorbed the hypothesis of an Indo-European modal genealogy and sewn into the compositional fabric a musical identification with the Hindu characters and their resistance against threatening others. And in embedding these modes into his opera ballet, Roussel further inscribed the link between Hindu and French music. In this reading, Roussel's use of modes represents no principled departure from musical exoticism as such, as scholars have implied, but rather manifests a compositional fruition of racialized musicological discourses of Indo-European patrimony. Similarly, that the borrowing operates on a structural rather than superficial stratum isn't evidence of a deeper engagement or sophistication, but likewise a byproduct of the quasi-philological conception of musical families akin to language families, sharing fundamental elements of their construction. By replacing the Indian impressions of evocation with a philologically mediated source of ostensibly Indo-European music, Roussel reconfigured his own subject position with respect to India, recasting it from an exotic musical other to an other classic. It would be naive to suspect Roussel was not aware of the discourses he was tapping into, if anything, Padmavati manifests Roussel's reflections on race and the importance of embodying race in compositional practice, sentiments he reaffirmed on multiple occasions, imploring, quote, that each race conserve in its music the ethnic character that gives it its particularity and originality. Finally, section three, this is the shortest. The idea of embedded classicism brings us to the case of Maurice Emanuel, the Hellenist musicologist and composer who was installed by Bourges Boudrey as his successor as musical history professor at the Paris Conservatoire. In his inaugural lecture of 1909, Emmanuel proved himself a true believer in the modal patrimony defended by Bourges Boudrey. Quote, I too will take up the cause of ethnic music, of musique de race, he declared, using a remarkable political metaphor to urge the foundation of a variegated république modale, a modal republic, as a bulwark against chromatic disorder. It was Emmanuel who articulated most systematically and explicitly the Indo-Europeanist case for the relevance of the Melocartas in a 1919 essay published in the Revue des Études Grecques. This article presents, to my mind, a microcosmic illustration of how Indo-European philology was adapted to musical materials and channeled into a compositional program. Step one, rationalization. Emmanuel takes the Melocartas, citing but not reproducing Grosset's table, and imposes his own analytical framework deconstructing them into tetrachords, their morphology as he sees it, a quasi-philological gesture that facilitates their comparison and assimilation to Grecian modes. Quote, all the Hellenic scales may be found in this table of Hindu modes. Emmanuel's quasi-philological reverse engineering constitutes a turning point in the formalist abstraction of the modes. Without acknowledging that the Melocartas were already an Indian taxonomic abstraction of the ragas, he atomized them further, thereby affording his comparative agenda. Step two, racialization. The Aryans of India have made it their job to inventory and develop the forces that lie in ancient scales. In Emmanuel's conception, the relationship between the Melocartas and modern music was not so much ancestral as familial, preserving something of the racial essence of a common proto-Indo-European source. And finally, step three, compositional agenda. The Hindu bard, who still resounds the harmonies with which Aeschylus and Sophocles shook their spectators possesses resources of which our artists so wrongly deprive themselves. And Emmanuel, Emmanuel led by example in his Sonatine numéro 4 on Hindu modes, executing, like Roussel, a superposition of classical Indian and French forms. Conceptually, Indian modality represents a short hop from the folk modality of, of uh, Emmanuel's first and third sonatines. Nevertheless, this sonatina might represent the first deployment of Indian modes in French music with no corresponding programmatic content. Uh, let's just hear the opening of the first movement where for 20 bars, Emmanuel strictly adheres to the seven pitches of the 53rd. 
peripheral to narratives of modernist composition, the centuries-old French tradition of organ improvisation. In 1925, Marcel Dupré published his Traité d'improvisation à l'or. In the chapter on theme, the basis of improvisation for the organ, Dupré proposed the use of the melocartas as melodic sources alongside plain chant in Greek music and a range of other so-called exotic scales. Similarly, Charles Tournemire included the melocartas in his Précis d'improvisation à l'or. Before concluding, he wrote, I record here some ancient scales which an ingenious improviser might rely upon to inform chorales, fantasies, sonatas, etc. For these organists, these modes are no longer explicitly tethered to intellectual contexts of Indo-Europeanism. Rather than as a patrimonial resource, they're presented as abstract forms, a technique to enrich the advanced organist's palette in improvisation or indeed composition. If we can't easily determine the extent to which organists truly implemented these scales, we can at least see their trace in a work like Tournemire's Orgue Mystique, where plain chant themes are harmonized and transposed occasionally into the Melicarta-inspired modes. If the Catholic liturgy seems an unlikely landing site for the Melicartas, it helps to recall that the French organ tradition was central to 19th century modalism and modal techniques of chant-based accompaniment, improvisation, and composition. Niedermeyer and Dortigue's method of harmonizing plain chant using only the notes of the chant mode was novel inspiration for Bourdeau Dupré's modal folk song harmonizations of the 1870s, and resonated in Dupré's advice that students might experiment with the assimilation of a number of these modes, applying their natural harmony to them using only the notes of the mode. One could argue that upon entering the organ loft, the Melocarta's assimilation to French modalism had come full circle. By the end of the 1920s, Maurice Emmanuel's modal republic got even larger. In his 1928 article, La Polymobile, he returned to his tetrachordal analysis of the 72 melocartas in order to add 72 more of his own creation. First, by preserving the perfect fourth of the lower, te lower tetrachord and lowering the fifth scale degree, so that makes 36, and second, by raising the fourth and lowering the fifth scale degrees simultaneously, creating 36 hexatonic modes, uh, and thereby incorporating several symmetrical modes, such as the whole tone scale, into the, into the complex. But more important than the 144 scales as such, the saliency of Emmanuel's move here resides in how this comparativist quasi-philological analysis of the Melicartas results in a combinatorial generative approach to modality. One is tempted to say that this complete generalization of modality is nothing but chromaticism by another name. Emmanuel preempts this critique by distinguishing between the overripe chromaticism that comes from the supersaturation of major tonal structures and the fecund chromaticism that comes from the kaleidoscopic application of diverse modal scales. It's this latter chromaticism which he connects to the vast Indo-Greco-Romano folkloric tradition and to the French values of clarity, purity, and liberty. Modality thus is no longer limited to a finite collection of scales. It's become an approach, a system, an ethos of modalism. Now, in light of these two contexts, the synthetic and exhaustive approach to modality built on this formalist generalization of structures and the modal tradition of organ music, one can't help but think of the system of synthetic modes invented by young Olivier Messiaen, Emmanuel's history student around the same time. Messiaen's modes of limited transposition are entirely different and irreconcilable note for note with the 72 melocartas, and as far as I can tell, Messiaen never used the Indian scales in his own music, even though he taught them to his students. students. And yet the idea of creating, on the basis of certain principles and structures, an exhaustive combinatorial modal system finds an echo in his approach and helps explain why the modes of limited transposition have, kind of bizarrely, been mistaken for so-called Hindu modes by so many critics and musicologists, a persistent confusion which Messiaen did not apparently seek to dispel. Okay, uh, I'll draw things to a conclusion. So I, I've tried to demonstrate that the encounter between comparative philology and musicology in the French context unleashed two interwoven processes. First, the racialization of certain musical cultures as Indo-European, and second, the rationalization of those musics in supposedly transcendent formal terms, scales in this case, although there's a parallel history about rhythm which I'm working on as well. This twofold mediation contributed to the abstraction of these cultures into forms no longer marked by cultural otherness, but rather assimilable and indeed assimilated through French selfhood. 
This capacity for formal abstraction is perhaps in some sense particular to music. Once Indian scales are no longer used to provide local color for Hinduistic operas, they may be perceived as nothing more than sounds or pitches. In other words, as Regina Bourne and David Hesmondhouse have proffered, musical forms may ultimately hide the traces of their appropriations, hybridities, and representations, and I'll add discursive histories. I don't know, for example, to what extent Messiaen was conscious or ignorant of the ethnic nationalist discourses that accompanied early 20th century questions of modality, but their abstraction and, uh, and, and uh, from such representative meaning is in a sense precisely the work of philological mediation. But the case of Messiaen brings us chronologically to 1940, uh, by which point another trajectory of Indo-Europeanism was taking its most extreme turn, a death spiral from linguistic theory to racist ideology to murderous reality, nourished by social Darwinism and shepherded by the demagogues of the Nazi party to fascistic, ultimately genocidal ends. By this point, Aryanism had made another far more visible impact on French musical life in the form of the explicitly anti-Semitic cultural agendas in occupied Paris and Vichy, manifested by the activities of, for example, the group Collaboration. Even here, uh, India remained a thematic point of reference. Consider Alfred Bachelet's Surya, a setting of Le Comte de Lille's Vedic hymn commissioned by the Vichy government, which fed transparently into Aryanist propaganda at its 1942 premiere. But despite the aggressive bombast of Bachelet's score, perhaps the more durable imprint of the Indo-European hypothesis is camouflaged in abstract forms, in scales and rhythms which have become naturalized in or as French music. Thanks for your attention. sorts of music we just heard. Uh, Delage spent a fair amount of time 
in India and elsewhere. And he was really marked by the experience of hearing music that very few of the composers I've discussed, or musicologists for that matter, that I've discussed today actually ever heard. Or if they did hear it, they were not interested in because they had seen it in some sense as the degraded remnants of an old tradition. And it was really that old tradition that they ended up. And so that's where I think the key distinction comes in where I'm talking about philological mediation and the reason why the results are so different. And the case of Delage is interesting from a kind of historiographical perspective as well, just in terms of how these things have been written about. When historians of French music have written about the kind of cultural contacts with Indian music, as with other forms of Orientalism, there's this kind of narrative mold that people fall, that I think scholars have fallen into, which is one of moving from fantastical stereotype toward authenticity. And Delage has in the past been held up as somebody who really experienced music, got to know it, and tried to reproduce these sounds authentically. And as I said, I think that's a bit of a red herring. I think what I think is going on is that their experiences of Indian music are mediated by different types of knowledge production. In the case of Delage, it's mediated by certain types of globalizing networks that allow him to be there, to be present there, but that also are occurring in spaces like Les Apaches that are kind of interested already in novel timbre, novel instrumentation, and that sort of thing. And so that coalescence informs how he listens to and responds to Indian music in a different way. Meanwhile, this philological mediation, again, we're not talking about moving toward more authenticity. We're talking about how different types of knowledge production inform what French musicians are wanting to see, hear, look for, and reproduce in these music. And so Delage is a wonderful foil, actually, for this narrative, because he just takes this contact with Indian music in a radically different direction, which is very useful for kind of throwing into relief what is distinct about this philological mediation. And the other thing that I would say, sorry if I can, there's no other hand up, is that in Delage, I think his music is so marked by that sense of difference and of otherness, the sense that this is outside of a tradition of a sort of type of music that can be recognized as French is important to him. Whereas through this philological mediation, actually it becomes so French that it ceases to be marked, that it imbues French forms and ceases to be marked in the score as other. And I think that's all part of this same type of distinction that I'm trying to draw. That's a really interesting distinction, actually. I don't know, I think in his early examples you were indicating that the characteristics were that the composer used to define the otherness in that way. Yeah, it's a transitional process. Okay. Sorry, let me just tweak that. It's the Hindi modes are used to define the other as the Hindu, but who actually is in some sense becomes the proto-self in terms of being their European continuity. So that's the kind of, that's the pivot point. Yeah. So it doesn't become a dialogue between Peter and Barbara. Can we have some other questions? We have some people joining us. Larry, keep me an eye on that. This infinite regress effect here. We're just waiting for it. But we do have people online. So is anybody putting their hand up on Zoom? Hello, everyone. Hello, Peter. Thank you for an excellent talk. I was applauding you then. Can you hear me? Yeah, I applauded rather than raising my hand initially, but I can assure you both feelings were appropriate. I was fascinated when you were talking about Roussel, whose music I came to through Witold Lutosławski's appropriation of Roussel in the mid to late 20th century. Lutosławski called Roussel a kind of French Brahms of the early 20th century. And now I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe he was appropriating a kind of Indo-French Brahms. And so I've got some thinking to do. But I wondered if you had a bit more to say about Roussel and this 
complex navigation between a somewhat respectful position regarding the Indian classical tradition, as I think you had it that he was framing it that way, and um, what he's trying to sort of shore up and promote and protect through the French strains and what he's doing. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know anything about Budislavski's reappropriation of himself. That's, uh, I would love to learn more about that. Um, I don't know if I have a lot more to say. I, I think I, I might have, I might have uh, exhausted the majority of what I have to say about Roussel, although the uh, invitation with Brahms, I find, is kind of intriguing and maybe suggestive uh, I guess they've both been uh, pegged for this kind of uh, preoccupation with form and with formalism. Um, and I think there is perhaps, I think Budasasi could be perhaps touching upon something there. And in some ways, I think that comes from Husserl's you know, uh, training under, under Dandy at the Schola Cantorum, where he will have been instilled with, uh, with a historical education and a particularly formalist one. As, as anyone who's looked at Dendi's you know, cool uh, will, will, will realize. Um, and I think that that's also part of what's feeding into to, uh, the way that he reads uh, about Indian music. Um, so that's what I think of when I, when I hear the, the phrase the French Brahms. Yeah, this kind of formalism that goes in, in hand with a kind of sort of class, a progressive classicism, if that makes sense. Um, what do you think? Well, I, I think it's interesting that um, you've got composers who are there. Are, there are similarities in terms of Lutoswaski's schooling, although his was in with um, Russian-schooled formalists in the early twentieth century. Um, there's um, it, it's striking that there's this sort of um. You t were you saying that the um, the 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 interest for Roussel in the Indian classical music was also formalist in, in the sense that it chimed with his sort of formalist training, or was he using it more as a way of um, freeing up, escaping, fraying those sort of more formalist aspects of his musical language? Uh, I don't know if I put the two things in opposition. Um, I think he was, freeing up, uh, he was freeing up forms that way, but he was doing it in this way that was very attentive to, to some notion of structure and of Formal construction rather than one attuned perhaps to sonority. I think that's how I would that's how I would phrase it, at least in the context of the repertoire I've covered here. Uh, if that makes sense. That does make sense. Thank you. That was unexpectedly useful. Thank you very much. Of knowledge from from you know 
ultimately between individuals, between people who we know did attend to that training and did read that sort of methodological scholarship. And I think one of the things that surprised me in the course of this research is the way in which I think, okay, I cited a number of historians of philology who say that this was in many ways hegemonic around the turn of the 19th century. At the same time, the notion of an Indo-European or Aryan race was deeply contested and really refuted at the forefront of kind of linguistic scholarship by the first decade of the 20th century. And so, you know, with the emergence in the history of linguistics around that time of experimental phonetics and structural linguistics with Saussure, the linguistic discipline by the 1920s and 30s has really moved on to other stuff. And so in that sense, it's really not, it's not intuitive that we would see in the 1920s and 30s musically the kind of fruition of this intellectual history. And that's why I think tracing these kind of relational transmissions through these key figures, including Bourgo and Emmanuel at the conservatoire, was a key methodological breakthrough in order to understand how these things are still carrying on in art, even once in the scientific realm, if you like, it's obsolete. So I think that raises a lot of really interesting questions about, yeah, how some of this science that is obsolete in this kind of scientific sense remains crystallized kind of like a bug in amber in some of this music. That, I think that raises issues around music, I don't know, it's sort of what we're on, it's continuing, I think, in Fulton in terms of musicology and how it's developing, that creates a major case for that, but also in musical composition. I think that's really interesting because we often think of music being quite a value-free or whatever free zone for what people do, and yet clearly this is an argument that seems to be not the case. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day we could say, okay, values that were imbued in the music through composition, but at the end of the day it's kind of, as Bourne and Hesbenthal should point out, you know, it's, in a certain sense, it's just sound, and it's very free, you know, it's free, it's in some sense very free, lends itself to a freedom of interpretive flexibility. And so, you know, perhaps we should seize the occasion to shift what these sounds mean. I don't know, I don't have an answer to your question, but yeah, in some ways, in some ways music preserves these things, in other ways it allows us to write over them kind of palimpsestically with whatever else we want to. But I think these are big questions. And the colonial traditions, as we think of India with Britain, you sort of alluded to that, can you create similar things going on in British musicology and British composition? I wonder, because in some ways it was less obvious. I know the French were very open to looking to inheriting Greek culture and inheriting other ancient cultures as a way of bolstering their own, but what do you know? I mean, that's perhaps an unfair question, given that you work in France. No, I can give them, I have a small answer. But I'm limited in it, so if other people in the room have better and fuller answers, please speak up. So there is this really interesting phenomenon that I think has been studied by some historians of linguistics, the way in which the development of the Indo-European hypothesis took off much more in France and Germany, and there was a lot more resistance to it in the British context for the reason that I said kind of in passing, that there's kind of an alienation in the fact that the British are colonizing people, that then they realize there might be this sense of ethnic kinship. And Friedrich Max Müller, whose book cover I flashed on the screen at one point, was a professor of Sanskrit, or of comparative philology, I think, at Oxford, was very critical of the British Empire in India on those very grounds. He said, you colonized your brothers, which is kind of shocking. So there's a somewhat fraught relationship there in some sense. But what's interesting is somebody like Hulse, actually, he studied Sanskrit at SOAS in the first decade of the 20th century. And 
And he did, he, he actually read Day's, Day's uh, work and used uh, some of the Melek cartels. And in a number of pieces, uh, if you give me a moment, I can find, I can find the footnote where I mention it. One of the pieces was actually performed in Paris, which is why it's kind of interesting. And I, and I hypothesize whether it's possible that uh, Roussel could have heard it uh, or not. Um, so there is something going on. And, 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 and some have even suggested that uh, the final, uh, that the scales in the final movement of the planets, um, that there's a usage of a melancarta there. I'm a bit ashamed at the moment, because there's a book, Resonances of the Raj, uh, and I'm drawing a blank on the author's name. But she actually discusses this uh, in the context of British music in a bit more detail. Um, also with projects like John Forbes' Indo-European Orchestra and that. Um, but of course, he's somebody who spent a lot of time in France as well. And it's interesting, to my knowledge, those were both people who were uh, sort of anti-colonialist uh, or in orientation. So there's, there's something there. And I think there's a really interesting project to be done um, in that context. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, hi, um, I was really interested in um, the example you gave of uh, Pierney's work um, because I, I'm, I'm currently looking at Pierney's incorporation of Basque elements within his music later on. Cool. And this is quite an open-ended question, but I was just wondering if you've noticed any parallels between treatment of these Indian elements that you've um, been studying and more internal exoticism with regions in France that did have different um, languages and identities. And I don't know if this is very open-ended, but are there any parallels, do you think? That's a fantastic question. Thank you so much. And that's really interesting to, uh, to learn about, because I don't know anything about, uh, about its use of Basque uh, melodies. But I have two things to say. So, so the first to say is that um, in the context of, of, I don't know, I should look at the camera, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, at the, in the context of Bourgo du Couvre, the one who I mentioned, uh, who had that kind of really chilling quote about uh, this, the, 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 these modes are the patrimony of our race and we who are uh, Aryans should, should use them. Uh, actually, he wrote that in the context of a history lecture that he was giving on uh, folk music, folk melodies from Brittany. Uh, so, you know, a, a region of France. He was from Brittany, actually, and he went on a folk song collection mission there. And it was upon hearing in his own kind of analytical worldview similarities between uh, Breton uh, folk music, Greek music, Russian folk music, uh, and some others that he kind of devised this Aryanist, pan-Aryan modalism theory. Um, so they're absolutely, you know, and, and Maurice Emanuel likewise uh, published uh, folk melodies from, from Burgundy uh, with a preface that makes very similar kind of uh, associations between French folk music and, and the Greek tradition, at least. So you're absolutely onto something. Now, Basque is a weird one because um, I think kind of famously Basque, the Basque language is not, <laughs> is not an Indo-European language. Now, does that stop them from, from this type of analysis? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, the point of reference, I guess, would be Charles Bau, uh, one of the other founders of the Schola Cantorum who was a big collector of, of Basque music and perhaps already looked at that source. I haven't found anything uh, in Bau's writing to suggest that he was trying to make that association. Um, but maybe he was. And, and Pierre Ney and Bourdeau were, 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 were family friends. So, you know, it's hard to imagine Pierre was not aware of, of, of some of these discourses, but I don't know how it fed specifically into his Basque appropriations. I look forward to learning more about what you discover. Thank you, that's, that's really helpful. I wonder if um, Julien Tirso is in, in, in involved in these debates, because he's also collecting books, very yeah. book songs and carols and things. Yeah, I haven't been able to pin him down. I haven't found anything in his writing that um, that that kind of implicates him in this directly. Um, I know that Bourgo du Coupé and Emmanuel are both really skeptical of Tirzo's work on folk songs, particularly on harmonization, kind of from a compositional perspective, because it's all tonal. Um, 
Emmanuel kind of makes a pun on his name, Tiens, so, so being a word for idiot in, in uh, French. So there's some, sort of two camps here. At the same time, you know, Tiens, so I think in some ways we recognize his activity as pretty colonialist. Uh, on the other hand, I think in some ways he's quite careful. Uh, he writes about Indian music and he basically says, we don't know anything about it, really. We have these books that are just full of terms. And he lists you know, the terms, like we've got all these terms to another cartoon on that. Uh, and, and you've got all these words, and, and he says composers are seduced by these words, and they think it's wonderful. But the truth is, we don't know anything about how this music is, is played or what it sounds like. He says that in, in right at the turn of the country, I think it's published in 1904 or so. So that's another interesting kind of point of comparison, that there are other ways to be researching Ended up with, um, I'm waiting for them to put their hands up, but you ended up with, with talking about the Second World War and where some of these debates take us, where the, these narratives. What about anti Semitism in France in that early period? If you're just you're talking about the turn of the century and the early 20th century, where of course that's there. So, where, where do yeah. these debates lie in relation to that form of, of French anti Semitism? Yeah, I think that's a key question. Um, sorry. I think the, the imprint of the Indo-European hypothesis or Aryanism generally on, on French music is multiple, um, and it's not just uh, philologically mediated, although I think that's a, an important strand that I've tried to talk about today. I think another important strand is, uh, is kind of uh, Wagnerian. Um, a, a lot has been said about Wagner's anti-Semitism, I think in some ways it's easy to assimilate Aryanism and Indo-Europeanism with anti-Semitism. In, in many ways, they're quite complementary. In many ways, they're also kind of different. Um, and I think in, in, there's not been quite as much work on, on the Indo-European hypothesis in the context of Wagner and Wagnerism. Um, Wagner was a really big reader of, of the Grimm brothers, as is well known. We have some of the comparative mythologists who are really trying to uh, construct sort of structural notions of, of Indo-European mythology and religion. Um, and so, you know, in Wagner, the way that this kind of research kind of manifests is really in his in this kind of mythological imaginary. These great sweeping epics that, in some sense, try to bring about uh, certain types of Fantasies, but also we might read them as Aryanist fantasies. And so in you know, 20th century France, with the reception of Wagner, I think no one more clearly than Vincent van Dee kind of inherits this. Um, and again, it's somebody that, you know, he somebody who's viciously uh, anti-Jewish anti-Semitic, and that manifests in his operas in very uh, sort of blatant ways, but ways which are very different from the way which we Right? Again, it's, it's more in this kind of dramatic sweep of these mythological 
with, was Pulsed uh, into Theosophy? There's something in my mind that's just you know, but I'm, I keep. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not certain. I know that I need to send a project on the Okay. Because um, uh, what you're, you're speaking about with this connection with, with kind of interest in, in global spirituality uh, in some ways, you know, represents another current. Uh, that we could place alongside theology, alongside dogmatism, and that, uh, which is, you know, that of, of theosophy, which a number of composers in the French com context were also very much interested in. And theosophy was deeply tied, this kind of a esoteric theosophy was deeply tied in with uh, theories of Arianism. I think even Helena Blavatsky wrote an article titled uh, Arian Music, and there were composers uh, I'm thinking of one in particular called Rita Stroll, who really yeah, went, went in kind of at the same time into this, plunged into the spiritual world and uh, musical world. And this played out not only in kind of interest in other musical cultures, but also interest in musical numerology and that sort of thing as, as well. Um, yeah, I think you're on the I, you know, at the same time, I'm kind of creating these different categories of inheritances of Indo-Europeanism, but I think ultimately they're very difficult to necessarily disentangle. Um, interest in, in comparative religion was also tied into the comparative, the broader comparativist projects. Um, so I think in some ways it all it all connects. Or maybe I don't know. It all connects. That's a kind of that can sound very kind of esoteric <laughs> cultist thing to say. <laughs> it does, and I wonder if we do we have any final questions from from anyone here in the room or on Zoom. It looks as though we don't. So, first of all, I want to thank Peter for a fantastic, really rich, and really stimulating talk today. A really fantastic. You've given us loads to think about, and we will continue to do that. And I'm very sorry for hogging all the questions, but the chance to <laughs> talk about French culture and, um, and music is um, too much of a complaint for me. <laughs> um, so if you do have any further questions for Peter, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them for you. So just contact him or contact contact us and we'll put you in touch. Um, and also to say for those of you who are here and those of you who are not, we will be going to the bar. So I'm very sorry you can't join us, those of you on Zoom. But the, if, if you are here in person, that is, that is lovely. But um, once again, thank you to Peter. And we look forward to seeing you all next week when Emily Howard and um, colleagues from PRISM will be um, talking to us about their work and some of it will be here at the RICM in the PRISM room um, on Zoom and online. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you everyone and um, speak to you, see you all very soon. Bye-bye.